This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question that's um, maybe a little bit uh, um, directly uh, linked to the Panaf politics, what you brought up at the beginning. And thinking about uh, the moment of the Panaf uh, politics and this idea of uh, building a nation would be a way to preserve or to sort of like give a, a power to your own culture. Um, and at this moment, if you want to think about it in the present, because you're also suggesting of how to bring back these kind of politics. So, um, yeah, if we want to think about these politics in, you know, in the now and the present, uh, at the moment where uh, nation states have, uh, you know, failed us and failed and, you know, we're totally um, collapsing, especially in the Arab world, um, and after 2011, um, how, how is this politics effective or can be effective today? Uh, what kind of maybe other forms of solidarity would, would we think about that are perhaps outside of a nation formation or... Absolutely right. Coming out, coming out of World War II, coming out of World War II, this also could go further than World War II, but let's just stay with the World War II. Uh, it became very important uh, to, nationalism become a working tool all over the world. And, and, national, and all the way to, our particular situation, the 1956 conference in Paris, or the Bandung Conference, which led to, uh, the Paris Conference was called Le Bandung Culturel, the cultural Bandung, because the French government told them, we don't want you to talk about politics, just talk about culture. So they call it the Bandung Culturel. And Césaire, Aimé Césaire, uh, Franz Fanon, many of the intellectuals were distancing themselves from negritude saying we need to build nation states. Uh, of course, uh, nation states in this sense, your point is very important. Nation states did not seriously question the, first, the xenophobia of nationalism itself, but also the sleeping regressive elements in many of our cultures, whether the European Americans, well, in America it's waking up now, and African. So, did not pay attention to this. But, so if you go from Fanon, Césaire, Saint Ben Ousmane, and all these cultural thinkers, to Glissant, Glissant's argument is this, nationalism was a necessary evil. But nationalism, should have led us to relation. So, so if, if you take a wretched of the earth, Fanon also said this pan-Arabism -Ara, pan and pan-Africanism uh, start first with nationalism in order to go to pan-Arabism and to pan-Africanism and the solidarity of the tri-continental that Salah was talking about. But of course, nationalism blocked all of that. You know, that we, we won't, and Glissant is saying, what you should do is, is think about relation. And relation is, again, as I was trying to define his notion of your need of the other to do anything, uh, his notion of difference. So how do we go from nationalism to this moment when uh, I know that I need you in order to do what I'm doing? And the you could be the ocean. The you could be uh, the trees. The you could be somebody across the frontier. So th this is what happened. We, we, we did not, Glissa in particular was talking about antianite, the Caribbean-ness. So how to go from the Caribbean frontiers to a Caribbean culture. Uh, but in Africa and in the Arab world, we need to theorize this more without the isolated intellectuals who become self-hating or 
these kind of notions, uh, you're not with, with us, therefore you are against us. So I think you're asking a very important essential question in this sense. What I can add is actually from a personal experience because I, I, I'm a Sudanese who's living abroad. Uh, in Sudan, I was engaged in the uh, politics when I was a student. Uh, of course, uh, that there, was, there was a very progressive movement in Sudan that was uh, very popular, trade unions, student movement, and so forth. But that movement was decimated, uh, definitely by the Islamist regime today, for several reasons, because they were actually, they were very aware of the tactics and activism of the left. They were in the same prisons and so forth. So when they took power, they really knew how to decimate that movement uh, through purging the civil service, the military, the universities, and so forth. So they did a certain practice that really decimated that legacy of the progressive movement. Then for me as, as, as uh, somebody who's living in the United States today, what, what role that I can do? I mean, the, the question that you pose is really very difficult, but it's also fundamental in terms of how do you really, so the, the work that I think, uh, which is Mancha touched on, is the idea of recovery of that politics, uh, of that solidarity. And my own interest now is actually in this axis of solidarity, where we're actually through the work of the Institute for Comparative Modernity, I'm working on a project we call it Axis of Solidarity. Basically, it's a project of recovery of all those, of that legacy that seems to be forgotten. And, and so I think first, the, the project of recovery itself and rewriting that history and making it available for the younger generation who did not know that. I have a lot of students who say, you say, do you know Fanon? Who is Fanon? Uh, uh, you ask them about apartheid. What is apartheid? I mean, this is really crazy because <laughs> We lived through the legacy of apartheid and activism, and that really played a great role in shaping my own politics and my own activism. But in reality, this is a whole generation that was a gap, and that is, so the work of recovery is very important in terms of really rethinking that. And in that context, being in the United States, and you know, as I, if I've lived in France, of course, I would be supportive of the French and the, uh, you know, the Senegalese or the French progressive movement or the Algerian. So wherever you go, there are certain kind of alliances that you make. If you espouse that kind of progressive politics or you know, the quest for justice. So in the United States, I thought the most important is really the black intellectual tradition for me. It becomes a discovery, a journey through people like Manche and other and several mentors just reading the work. I found that the work is very fascinating. So if you ask me in a nutshell, I mentioned earlier those moments of you know, solidarity, but what I wanted to emphasize now, given the chance, because I was in the filmmaker or the speaker or the artist, is what does it mean recovering that black uh, intellectual tradition? I thought there are major contributions that are very important to development of theory. One is that you will notice that uh, in the legacy of, let's say, radicalism, Many black intellectuals were part of the Marxist movement or members of the French Communist Party, but then suddenly they left. If you read Richard Wright in a book that is actually one of the most anti-communist books, <laughs> uh, there's not, it's called the God, the God Must Fail or The God Must Fall or something like that. The but God then that the God That Failed. <laughs> and it's about, of course, the collapse of the of communism and so forth. But interestingly, that essay is, is really not an anti-communist essay. It was about his own journey in the, in the in the, in the, in the, in the uh, radical politics in which whites were dominant. And to, to discover that actually through that is that yes, class is important. You know, the idea of the class struggle in classical Marxism is very important, but he discovered through that journey that race is also important. Separate trade unions, his own experience as somebody who's traveling to a major conference, not even finding a one couple or anybody to house him, so he goes to Harlem. So from that day on, he resigned and left. It's a very beautiful, fascinating essay that can give you a clue. So the contribution of the beginning of what we now know in theory as intersectionality came out of the black tradition. Du Bois' contribution, which is recovered by Fanon, I've just highlighted, the idea of the color line. He said it in the early 20th century, that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line, for sure. I mean, other scholars talked about it from earlier days where the colors, you know, this hierarchy of color that also had that significance in terms of class and, and other issues, that became the idea of the veil. Then comes Fanon and, and the idea of the double consciousness. 
for African Americans, not really accepted as Americans, but not fully actually anymore as African. So that tension that actually drives the black subject becomes very important. And so this is one, but then if you look at the, uh, in, in the years after Fanon and others, you find that there is kind of a revision or return to Du Bois, and, and that genealogy is very important. Then comes the feminist movement, and it's more specifically the black feminist movement. And the contribution that should be credited, nowadays there is this kind of sexy word, <laughs> intersectionality, everyone is using it. But actually it should be credited to Kimberly Crenshaw, who actually came of the legal scholarship, you know, arguing the situation of black women, and thinking about the fact that it's not only race, it's not only class, it is also gender. Then came other subjectivities, whether it's gay and lesbian, queer studies, and so forth, that came in, and transgender, and so they came in. So intersectionality becomes this theory that can be expanded. And so I thought that intersectionality is one of the most important contributions that came from black, uh, especially critical race theory. So I find that the work for me today, I can't do everything, we have a limited life span, <laughs> is the work of recovery, of facilitating that kind of recovery, in the, in the hope that this will lead to more theorizing, awareness of that past, in a Sankofa style, as the Pan-Africanist or Afrocentrist would say, but it's also a, a, that usher of this kind of futuristic thinking. Glissot comes in, opacité, you know, uh, uh, creolization, that thinking about the whole world, it's not a matter of creolité, that's just specific to the, <laughs> to the Caribbean, it is everywhere. Even the white world itself is part of that creolization. You can't just touch a place and then you think it won't come back and haunt you. I mean, for France to dream of getting rid of the Algerian and, 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 the, uh, and the Senegalese, <laughs> that's a dream that will never be you know, fulfilled. That kind of quest for purity that you see is reenacted now in the West, whether it's Trump or right-wing politics, that can never happen because the world is forever contaminated, creolized, and it's moving in that direction. So this kind of moment of theorizing will be beneficial, and I see the hope in that kind of Black Lives Matter link with the Palestinian, but it's also other axes that are very important that can help us rethink a new world. I mean, I think, if you think about the history of the world, I mean, of course, uh, when you think about, let's say, Marxism or the Russian Revolution, or, I mean, these are really, in the span of time, they're really short periods. <laughs> but in the larger sense, I think that is the next, you know, this kind of a futuristic quality, Toby or not is what we're really hoping for now, that can be, create a crisis that can attack that kind of paradigm of all the revolutionary ideals and move on to, to really think uh, uh, in a new way because the challenge of new liberalism and the new um, you know, kind of the triumph of the market is really difficult to surmount. But I think there are hopes there in that kind of process of recovery. That answer your question? Not sure, but I, I think listening to you yesterday, we are all engaged in this. Thank you. <laughs> So we had these um, controversies on uh, Sam Durand and Dana Schutz and the question who is allowed to speak for whom? What is your point of view to these issues? Yeah, uh, my generation it was uh, speaking for the subject or can the subaltern speak? That's how they used to call it uh, with uh, Gayatri Spivak uh, and so on. Uh, I think First, the most important thing is to allow people to name themselves. I don't think it's really a problem to speak for somebody else. That's not a problem. What, what is a problem is to take somebody's place and never let them speak, you know, which is this rationality issue that I was talking about, transparency, uh, you know, silencing the, world, the rest of the world and defining them like Hegel did you know, when Hegel's definition of history, you know. So now, because of the avant-garde, because of uh, philosophy becoming metaphilosophical, if I can say that, uh, people began to really talk about the impossibility, impossibility of uh, utterability, if I can add those two ugly words together. 
You know, you can't speak for the other, the, this impossibility. I really think that, uh, and Salah was talking about solidarity, if I can link these things. Gleason thinks that the specific element, two important elements of this solidarity, one comes from orality, because writing had silenced people. Now you can, you know, my brothers, and when I say brother, not in the African sense, I mean it in the Western sense, same mother, same father. <laughs> so let's put it that way. My brothers uh, didn't go to school. Therefore, they were out of the world for a long time, but now with cell phones, they just send me a message. I can just get the WhatsApp and hear my brother talking to me. So orality now is, you know, with Derrida's time, he was trying to fetishize writing. And he's coming from not only uh, Western tradition, Sufi tradition, mystical traditions, and so on. So writing was the most important when I was a student. Orality is the most important now because it is giving voice to more people. Uh, so this whole idea of speaking for somebody else is not that relevant to me anymore with the development of the reemergence of orality, or what he called recovering. You know, because it was very difficult to get ethno philosophy into philosophy when writing was the most important thing. But we were or the emergence of or orality this become important. The other aspect of Salah's point and your your important question is that Gleason says this, uh, and we're talking about solidarity. Your most intimate intuition, your most secret intuition in this room, you think only you know is your private thing. Uh, Glissa is saying is being felt by someone else in France, in Japan, in other places. So how do we create a solidarity between intuitions? This is what we are not daring to do today. How do we connect these intuitions uh, that are against, you call it neoliberalism? Intuitions that are against different things, but intu intuitions that are also for different ways of being in this world. But we always think that our intuitions are private, uh, except when it's in jazz, where you, you can improvise and so on. But so how do we connect intuitions around the world and create solidarity of intuitions and almost makes intuition scientific in many ways. So it, I, I think I hear you, because this is the world that you and I are coming from, where men can speak for women, women can speak for children, or, and so on and so on. So we make these categories and hierarchies. Uh, but they become so bec for the right reasons, uh, because uh, of the uh, masculine domination, because of rational domination, and so on. So how do we, let everybody speak. How, you know, how do we get this cacophony, you know, uh, without creating unnecessary hierarchies, uh, but also not intimidate people with theory and philosophy by saying he can't speak for so and so, you know, because you need to tremble with so and so. How do you tremble with that person? If if people didn't tremble with colonialism in Africa, without the Communist Party, com communism probably would have lasted longer in Africa would have the, the European communist, you know, at least in Francophone Africa. And you know, I don't want to generalize too much. So they trembled with our trembling, with for, and our trembling was very clear. Forced labor, uh, unequal salary, uh, representability. Africans couldn't run to be governors in their own countries. So communists said, this is wrong. You know, so they tremble without trembling, basically. So, and of course, later on, we had to kick the communists out and so on uh, for the right. And <laughs> you talk about Richard Wright leaving the communist parties for the right or wrong reasons. But we need to tremble with the trembling of with any kind of oppression. And we're not doing that. Uh, and the media's and philosophy, our, our highest philosophers, in my tradition, I don't want to talk about other people's area, and I'm not a philosopher, but the people we read from uh, Heidegger to Derrida, they didn't care about what was happening in the third world. Your Foucault, Roland Barthes' grandfather was in Abidjan, but he talked about mythology, but he really didn't talk about what was happening 
you know, the best European philosophers didn't care or didn't know or didn't want to deal with it. It's too complex, I can't speak for them. So you know, if you're trembling with somebody you feel right, I think you should go ahead and tremble with that person. <laughs> Because of course, this how can you differentiate uh, the usage of these terms? Because of course, these terms were used to allow, for example, the women in Saudi Arabia not to drive for many years, and up till today, they cannot actually go outside of the country without their uh, man guard, and this is the word, or uh, the gays uh, being killed in Africa, or the correct rape in South Africa, and everybody using the word, uh, this is not the culture. You know, this is our culture. I mean, if, when you see people saying, ah, no, so we don't have uh, lesbians in Africa. So, and of course, they rape them. You know what I mean? Of course, uh, so that how to differentiate, and I'm referring also to ethics of identity of Kwame Abia. How can we think about identities and specificities, but within a kind of uh, uh, ethics framework? And uh, so, I would like to, because of course I didn't see the, the film. Right. I don't know how right. the, the, right. the right. investigation, the interview, the etc. Uh, developed. Right. So I wanted just to wanted mention that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, this is very important. Uh, I, I think I alluded to earlier, in the earlier introduction of the panel, I said that I went to France because of rock and roll. Okay, and, <laughs> okay. But so uh, it's, it's important because I grew up in Bamako in a milieu where uh, we had, it was not rare at all. I had best friends who were homosexual, lesbian. Uh, we didn't discuss them in the discourse that we have in the West by naming, but when we, you know, they were homosexuals. And so to, to make the argument that there is no homosex, homosexuality is not an African culture, uh, that's convenient. That's a convenient and comes with, again, the same and the other that Gleason is talking about. Where the same is saying everybody has to be like me and what I am is the tradition, is the legitimacy, is so let's ex exclude ev everyone else. So Gleason, whole philosophy is based on critiquing that. And what he means by opacity, yeah. what he means by opacity really is, uh, Gleason has been always troubled by the way philosophy excluded poetry. Because philosophy is more interested in explaining in clarity, in transparency, in systematicity of the systems, and excluding any difference. And from Plato on, poetry, because it's, it's, it's uh, prone to double interpretation. So you will have to kick poetry out of the cave there. You know, poetry can be part of our discussions. And so Glissa is very interested in bringing back this first utterance of the world the speech, the speech that become poem, and the poem that could have several meanings, and how you can find, a, so opacity for him, therefore, is this translucence, this uh, sparkle, this, uh, I don't know, uh, this small light that can come out of the dark, and that become uh, the energy, that become energy to connect to another life and to bring, uh, uh, to connect the world together, to bring together what he called totality monde or two monde or one world in relation. So he's looking for that moment in us where we can go beyond uh, linearization, we can go beyond finitude, like something is finished, this is what this means and that's it. So that's what he's looking for. So opacity actually is 
awaken in you all the energies that you are repressing, as opposed to saying this is who, who you are and this is your authenticity and you have to exclude everything. So when you read Gleason, if I gave you even a little bit of impression that Gleason would be the kind of person who's telling uh, this dogmatic person, this fascist, to say, hold on to your culture against other people's culture, then you comp it's my misreading. I'm sorry. Okay. But he, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing that I would just add in answering your question about Dana Schultz and the, uh, the painting uh, on Emmett Till, I think that what you, ha what you see is a reflection of the politics of exclusion more than anything else. Because in the context of the United States, if you, to, if you just look at the market, or you look at museums, what necessitated having the Studio Museum in Harlem, for example, is the exclusion. This is in the center. You look at all these institutions. From the, uh, uh, um, the show that was uh, Harlem in my mind and all of those things, you will find this kind of idea of speaking for the <laughs> black people has always been dis determined by, you know, uh, um, by white curators, by white directors of institutions. So in the context of the United States, race is very important. And so the question of who speaks for the other becomes, and the question of representation becomes very important. So if you ask me personally, I thought it was not a great painting anyway. So that's not a, that's just about the painting itself. And many of these uh, uh, young white artists, frankly, are overrated, you, you, you know, because of the nature of the market and the museum and the exposure. I mean, it's, it's really scandalous for, for, for MoMA to hire somebody in the 21st century, okay, and to ask him to be the person who can enrich the black collection. They're sitting right there in New York where the greatest artists from David Hammonds to the earlier uh, movements, you know, the black art movement and others, there's Harlem Renaissance, all these great artists never got a retrospective unless they're dead. You know, so, 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 and it's recently that you find that that struggle still continues. So th the reflection of it, of course, I'm against censorship. I'm against uh, uh, destruction of artwork, which is what, uh, I forgot the name of the uh, artist who stood behind, you know, in front of the painting and Hannah, yeah. So I, I thought uh, uh, that, that I'm against it because that's the beginning of fascism. Once you enter into these territories of censorship and so forth, and the oppressed should never enter into that territory. You know, you should never get into engaging of destruction of books and art. So that, that is, I'm totally against it. But I think the work should be subject to evaluation like any other work. But you have to have in mind what's happening in the United States. And the exclude, I mean, I tell you from the academic perspective, as, you know, Mancho was talking earlier about, uh, you know, uh, uh, tenure uh, in an academic institution. You do the work that, you know, get you the tenure, then you, after that you speak. Of course, in the process, you'll be losing <laughs> your voice and so forth because you're conforming to the mainstream. What happened to us at that time? Apply, send an article to our journal or our bulletin and so forth, they'll be rejected. I mean, you're speaking about contemporary modern art, what is that? So one of the things that, you know, luckily, we managed somehow to, be, you know, to get tenure, but one of the things that led me uh, and other colleagues, Okwe and Wezor and Olu Ogbib and others, is to establish our own magazine and to establish it with the same standard, the Inca Journal of Contemporary Art. Now it's published, we started in a Brooklyn apartment in a dingy small office at Cornell, but now it's taken by Duke University and the same white scholars that used to exclude us earlier in this editorial, but they're now sending their students or they themselves jumping on the wagon. So, so, so it's possible to struggle against it, but then that's the situation that make people complain. It's not like really uh, black artists or black art historians really just like to complain. That culture of complaint, of course, is problematic, but then, because in my idea is that you just go do your things, and that's what happened. The Studio Museum becomes a very important institution. I mean, all these major artists, from Kerry James Marshall or others, if you think about the major stars today, Kehinde Wiley, they started in the studios residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. That's why when people criticize people like Selma Golden, I say, they just don't know the role that that the Studio Museum and Selma Golden have played in the life of artists in New York City and in the life of artists, uh, uh, black artists across the globe because she, she also had this global vision of having Africans beyond the, beyond the, uh, beyond the confine of African Americans. The <laughs> definition itself expanded to include diasporic Figures, if you think about who is Kahindi Wiley, Nigerian. You, so you, you get into their ethnicity, you discover that 
the, the definition of an African American is self-expanded with that kind of development. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop here, but I think the issue is exclusion and the practice of exclusion that's behind that kind of politics. Sorry, I'm so sorry, it's difficult to cut this, but I think people need to eat. <laughs> and, and we will start, thank you so much again, and we will actually start the next session on time, so eat quickly. At 2.30.